Hey everybody, I'm Matt from Spark Lighting, uh, here to show you some Mosaic and Pharo software basics. All right, so we've got a brand new show file. Um, it's creatively named test file, makes sense to everybody. And of course the author, Spark Lighting for Attractions. Uh, here in the notes section, uh, we love to comment on our file. So we'll say file starts, new today, we'll have to comment, um, helps keep everybody on the same page when we've got different people um, working in a file. So hopefully that's a discipline you guys can follow too. So first thing out of the gate with a new show file, we need to pick a location. I'm gonna select Abu Dhabi. Seems like a great place to have a lighting project. Um, when we set the location in this file and we ultimately upload it to the controller, that's what lets the controller understand its place in the world. So astronomical clocks, lunar clocks are all gonna reference based on that um, geographic location. You might find that on your projects, um, the city that you're residing in is not listed in this rather extensive list of options across the country or across the world. Um, so you can use a, a quick Google map search and you can get your latitude and longitude coordinates, drop those in. Um, we do that a lot too. All right, so we have a brand new file. Now we're ready to start placing some fixtures. We'll go over to the layout tab. This is kind of home base uh, for starting a brand new file. You can see on the right, we've got a selection of various lighting fixtures. Um, helpful to remember that you've got more uh, of a library than, than just shows up here. If you use the right button, the cloud, it's gonna pop up another menu. These are all of the fixtures that are in the inventory um, from Pharos. So we can go select, for example, say we wanna do some Cameo fixtures, hit download, and if we're connected to the internet, it's gonna pull that file down um, and load it in our available options here. So just remember, if you don't see the lighting fixture you're looking for uh, at first pass, it's probably available in the more extended library. So let's take just a 8-bit RGB fixture Let's grab this guy, we'll drag and drop it onto the layout tab, and there we go, we've got our first lighting fixture. One of the things we really like to do is to leverage the name field to contain a lot more information than just a cute name for our light. So here we're gonna say, um, this is an LED diode by S4, sure. And we'll use a vertical line to separate it. And let's say that this is associated with the load station tree. Sounds fun to me. So helpful to remember, we can also change um, the appearance of the icon of this light. We can change its size. Let's set it to 25 pixels wide and tall. Um, we can also make it a circle rather than a square. So we don't get super carried away in layout, but it is helpful to um, draw some distinctions between different lighting types, can make it easier to visualize what's going on with a project. Um, copy and paste here is a great friend. So little control C, control V. Now I've got a second lighting fixture and a third. You'll notice that Pharos has been smart enough to graduate my fixture number here uh, by one every time I copy and paste a fixture, which is great. Um, we use that fixture ID number in Pharos and also in our lighting uh, design documentation. That kind of becomes the universal lookup number. So uh, if you're looking at one of our prints, you'll see a fixture ID and it's usually a big blue uh, set of numbers that will correspond with the fixture number or this number field uh, in Mosaic Designer. Okay, so some lighting 101 before we get into patching. In most of our systems, uh, we've got a single controller It's called a, that, that is issuing broadcast information to everyone who wants to listen. So that's uh, multicast uh, data traffic. So lighting fixtures, um, are looking for a start address. So that just tells the lighting fixture of this massive set of data, what little section do I need to pay attention to? DMX lighting fixtures uh, can listen to one of 512 channels. If you think about it, it's like having a street with 512 houses and each house has a mailbox. Some lights, fancy lights that wiggle around and change colors, need more than one control channel, so they'll have more than one mailbox to receive information. So when we set the start address of a light, we're telling that light which very small subset of data to look at. And then that data is present all the time because the controller is always sending data everywhere. So we have 512 addresses um, or 512 houses on the street. That is per universe. So each street is an additional universe. Most of the projects that we work in 
uh, have multiple universes of control. Um, we don't have to max out all the available post office boxes in that one universe. Um, oftentimes we'll use a universe designation um, to kind of identify where a controller is located physically. So quick example, um, we may not have 512 DMX fixtures worth of lights for a particular area, but we'll say every light that's gonna go in the garden area will be universe 10, but every light that's at the load station of the attraction, that'll be universe 11. It's an easy distinction and allows us to, um, at quick glance, know where a control signal is emanating from. So patching time. We've got our fixtures that we established in the layout view. Now we need to create a relationship between that fixture and the output side of our system. So in Mosaic, it's pretty simple. Um, we have multiple universes. A universe is a collection of 512 DMX output channels. If you want to think about that, it's 512 houses on a street. We've got multiple universes that are available to us. So here we've got two on this particular controller. On the left side of the screen, I've got all fixtures here by type. So here are the four fixtures we created earlier and patching couldn't be easier. I take the fixture and I drag it over. I could even take a group of fixtures and I could drag them over. Great, right? If I happen to make a mistake and I don't like where a fixture's patched, this usually happens much later in the process, I can highlight that fixture. I can hit the unpatch button. It'll make sure, it'll ask me to make sure that I really want to do that and we can unpatch and that fixture is back open and available. Couple of interesting things in the patch window. If you happen to be on a project site and you're trying to hunt down a specific light, you can go to the patch tab. If you click on an individual fixture, so here it's fixture number two, which is patched at DMX address four. Uh, this light bulb icon, uh, if I'm connected to a controller, I can hit that light and it's going to, the icon, I'm sorry, and it's gonna highlight that lighting fixture. So it's an easy way when you have hundreds and hundreds of lighting fixtures, you're trying to nail down one that's being problematic. That's a great way to test. Okay, so, so far we've patched four fixtures. Uh, these were just on the DMX output ports of the controller. Little quirky part about Mosaic and Pharos, if we're sending traffic uh, using the SACN or the ArtNet protocol, both of those are IP-based protocol for delivering data, which is pretty typical of our projects. Uh, mainly because it lets us leverage a, an IT backbone to connect controllers and output devices. Um, little quirky in Pharos and Mosaic, we actually have to add a new universe uh, for each SACN universe that we want to patch to and each ArtNet universe. The two universes that are located here kind of by default when we open up the file, believe it or not, those are actually referring to the physical um, DMX ports, the 5-pin XLR ports that are on the controller itself. So if we want to patch to an SACN universe, uh, from the drop-down menu here, new universe, SACN, let's say we want universe 12 and add. So now I get an additional protocol tab. And if I click on the protocol tab, there's my universe 12. Now let's say we want to assign these fixtures over, even though we previously patched them, patch and drag, and we're going to get a confirmation message. Yes, we want to unpatch existing. There you go. Another thing to note here on SACN universes, you can see I have a unicast option. Um, theatrical guys are not going to be real familiar with multicast versus unicast data. The, the general in, in entertainment world, um, SACN is almost exclusively uh, multicast, meaning that that traffic is going to every controller. However, when we're using Mosaic or Pharos controllers and we're doing a lot of pixel mapping, so we're driving hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of universes worth of data, uh, the multicast topology um, tends to, to really clog network switches, even on a gig E system. So uh, we tend to use unicast data for really pixel rich or really data um, intense outputs. So let's assume that the four uh, fixtures we have patched here are four fixtures within a thousand pixel array. In that case, because it's a lot of network traffic, we would choose against um, using this universe as a multicast universe. We'd instead click over and make universe 12, uh, SACN universe 12, uh, make that a unicast universe. Um, so in Ferris or in Mosaic, um, we're given an option to enter an IP address. This IP address would be the IP address of the um, device receiving the data stream or the pixel controller. So let's say it was 192, 
16801. We add that address. Now we're taking SACN Universe 12 and all of that data. We're only sending that data to that specific IP address. Now it's time to move on to the timeline view. On the left, you can see that I've got all the fixtures that we just patched. In the center section here, we see uh, a tab in timeline one. So what we, uh, time is represented from left to right and the fixtures are represented from top to bottom. And then over on the right, we've got uh, a palette here with some parameters and we can take these attributes or parameters and we can drag them onto the timeline. Uh, so a couple of things, just as I'm starting in a new file, uh, a few things I like to do. So I'll grab a couple of lighting fixtures and I'll alt click and create a new group. We'll call these right side fixtures. And then same thing up here, I'm gonna alt click, make a new group, left side fixtures. Just like uh, a big moving light rig, I really like to work in groups. So break a large collection of lights down to their smallest, most uh, manageable part. By using groups and working in the groups, it really speeds up workflow. Um, rather than trying to hunt for a specific light, if you use very, a large number of very small groups, it, it's actually a faster way to work. So we have our two groups here. Let's just do a basic uh, red color. We're gonna drop that onto the timeline. And you can see over here on the right, I've got a variety of different options. I can change the start time of that parameter so we could actually start that at two seconds if we wanted to. Um, we have transition time. So by default, uh, two seconds to fade in, two seconds to fade out. So let's drop in a rainbow effect on the left side fixtures, something a little more exciting. You can see the parameter options here are different. We've got a period for a loop and a period for a count. Um, so these are different ways of manipulating that basically built-in effects generator um, across that group of fixtures. Uh, timeline tab at the top. So we, everything needs to be labeled. So we can all click here and call this test timeline one. So we're ready to create another timeline. We go to the upper left and click new, drops a timeline and gives us a chance to give that a label. So we'll call this test timeline two. Now we're ready to go. Quick thing to remember, there is a manage button in the upper left. If you click on that, you can see all of the available timelines. Um, it's pretty uh, conceivable that in a project you'll have 10 or 20 different timelines. And that's a lot to work with if you have all those tabs open, um, unless you're one of those weird people that has like 32 tabs open in their Chrome browser, but we'll just pretend those people don't exist. Seeing all the available timelines, and here I have the option to delete them. I can duplicate a timeline um, or, I can, uh, or I can open the timeline. So we've got both one and two open. If we wanted to duplicate timeline two, I can use the duplicate function. There we go. On most projects we're working with, we're building a timeline and whether that's 10 or 20 or three minutes, ultimately it's gonna loop and repeat again. Um, in the upper left here, we have the option to loop our timeline. So something really important to check after you've programmed a really awesome looking timeline and all of a sudden all the lights die unexpectedly, it's usually because you haven't hit the loop button. So I'm gonna create a new trigger. I always start with the soft trigger. So remember, if you don't have a user interface, a touch screen or a button station anywhere in the project, the only real way to manually trigger uh, a timeline is gonna be from the web interface, which is a soft button. So I'll fill out a few of these. We'll call this run timeline one. And the action associated, if I go to the upper right and hit new, I wanna start a timeline and I'm gonna do test timeline number one. So I flipped over to another file that has a more exciting set of triggers. So you can see it here in the upper left, we've got some uh, contact closures that are doing uh, emergency conditions on this particular attraction. Uh, you can see here triggers 10 through 13 have a, a gray hatch um, going through the line. That's to notate that those are not enabled. So if you need to go in and modify a trigger, uh, take a look, we're gonna highlight trigger number 10. Then over here on the right in the properties, there's a small uh, checkbox for enabled. Mm -hmm. So enabling that uh, will remove the gray hatching and now that trigger's active. Um, is it uncommon to have some triggers in your uh, particular project that are disabled uh, for a particular season? Or mm -hmm. in this case, this attraction doesn't operate in the winter, so certain things don't apply. Another look here while we're in uh, a more advanced set of triggers if we needed to change the timing 
uh, on our particular look. Let's go down here to uh, this Moonlight Madness trigger, which is a particular event at this property. We'll open it up. We can see we've got a timeline that's set to start. It's six o'clock, so 6 a.m. every day. If we wanted to modify that time, uh, we can go over to the edit button on the right here in the parameters. And then now we've got options for um, once a day, 6 a.m. Here's where we would adjust time. Thanks for checking out our Mosaic and Pharos basics. We'll have some more content coming out with the tips and tricks that we use around our projects to help stay organized and work efficiently. If there's any topic that you can think of or you'd like to have us elaborate on, you can drop it in the comments and always remember to like and subscribe.